so uh, our neighborhood passions affinity network is brought to us by Google Republic Services, and of course, Neighbor to Neighbor. I'm going to be hosting this evening. And so tonight we're going to focus on the, na the neighborhood beautification and environment passion. And our topic is how to use water wisely uh, in our gardens and lawns. And so uh, using water wisely is really especially important during the summer. Uh, many homes double or triple their water use uh, versus that what they use in the winter time. Uh, the majority is used for lawns and gardens, of course. Uh, and for me, my grandson's swimming pool, <laughs> and most of us uh, could typically maintain with 25 to 40% less water. That's surprising, isn't it? So during this session, we're gonna discuss ways to use water more wisely and reduce your, hopefully, your water bill uh, and conserve one of our most precious assets. Tonight to talk about that is Julie Berbiglia. Did I say that correctly, Julie? <laughs> um, who is with Metro Water Services. Uh, Julie, uh, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, absolutely. So I am so happy to be here. Um, and uh, so, yeah, my name is Julie Berbiglia. I am the education specialist at Metro Water Services, which means I get to do all kinds of really fun stuff, like talk to groups like you all about my passions and your passions in water. And I get to, um, let's see, today I went to a summer camp at Owls Hill Nature Sanctuary, which was tons of fun to talk to the kids about using water. And I get to um, take school groups on tours and go to schools, all of which we will be doing again now, which is fantastic. So I've been with Metro Water for about 15 years now. And one of my passions all along for a very long time now has been gardening, plants getting dirty. And in fact, um, prior to uh, uh, joining you all today, I was um, running outside to trade plants with uh, somebody in the neighborhood. So, um, <laughs> Um, but I'm very, very happy to be here with you all and share with you some watering tips, which, um, you know, given the amount that it has rained recently, mm -hmm. you might think that that is not something we need. But the truth is that, um, you know, we all know the hot, dry times are going to come, right? And so we're going to have to deal with that. What's interesting to me is that Nashville gets, or yeah, Nashville gets about 52 inches of water a year. Hmm. Um, we, however, don't get it one inch per week like we would like. <laughs> so we have to learn how to deal with it otherwise. Um, so I do have a short presentation that I think will help us understand some of this. Let me see here. Ooh, I have found my screen to share. Thank you so much. And let's get this up and going and set up so you can okay. see the pretty pictures. There we go. Okay. I think we are good now. Okay, so um, I want to give you a lot of tips that are coming from a larger program, which I'll, I'll stick in the chat for y'all later, which is called Tennessee Smart Yards. And this is a program between the uh, various countywide storm agents, stormwater agencies across the state, like Metro Water Services and the Extension Service, UT Extension. And the idea really is to connect people with their local waterways. So in Nashville, for example, we have over 2,800 miles of creeks, streams, and rivers in our county, which is a lot. So everybody's actually very close to water. Um, we just want people to understand that what you do on your property doesn't just end there at that, that barrier that's on the parcel maps, um, but rather, you know, the water hits your land and flows off and can take pollution with it. So that's a lot of what this program is about, but it's great gardening tips. So let's take a look at something that I think is just a great way to start with this, which is we now have um, in Metro Water for the last couple of years, we have a tiered system of how you get charged for water if you're being charged for Metro Water. So this is set up basically so that if you were using the basic amount of water that you need to to live and do your basic daily stuff, uh, you're not gonna pay anything extra. 
But if you are a huge user of water, especially during the summer, and we're maybe 30% of more of your, your water use could be going outside on the lawn, then if you're using a huge amount of extra water that is not really necessarily necessary for daily life, that really is something that is um, a luxury in a sense, then we wanna make sure that that extra strain on the system is being paid for. Um, so it's, and we also want people to have an incentive to conserve when they can. And so that's why we now have this tiered system. So basically, um, you know, the water becomes more expensive once you get past a certain point. And, and you probably have seen bill inserts and um, things on the news and Facebook and all that kind of stuff about this. But here's another cool thing is that let's understand a little bit about um, what happens with your, your sewage costs, because we don't have a meter on your sewer line going out. We know how much water you use. And we just assume that most of the time, the vast majority of that water is going back into the sewage system. And so you get charged for the cost to clean that water up before it goes back in the river. Now we do know, however, that during the summer, a lot of that water, again, maybe 30%, is not going back in the sewer. You're putting it in the ground. And so you don't have to pay for sewage for that. So the way we figure that out is this little equation here that we take your average um, use and then we are going to, yeah, from April to November, we're taking your average water use because it's going to be those rainier times then. I might've gotten that backwards, sorry, but we take your average, so, and I think I did looking at it now, you know, COVID brain, um, but we take your average winter use and we add 30% and that's your seasonal sewer adjustment. So sorry for the slide, whoops. Yeah. So it's really actually November then to what, March? It's really November to about April. April. Yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry about that. Woo! Mm -hmm. How the year goes, what month is it? Um, okay, but anyway, all of which is to say is that we know that during the summer, some of your water's not going down the sewer and your bill is automatically adjusted for that. I have a yeah. question, Julie, about you said sure. that our, the cost of our water goes up based on the amount of water. Isn't that what that last slide was? Yes. And so how do we know that amount of water? How do we know our amount of water? Sure, excellent, excellent question. Okay, so so it's um, it's sort of weird. I'll just put it out there. It's a little weird. Um, we don't charge in gallons. So um, you either across the country, you either get charged for water in gallons or 100 cubic feet, <laughs> which is what that CCF is, um, which uh, and there's some sort of engineering reason that um, and hopefully one day it will go to gallons because it's easier to understand. Anyway, so when you look on your bill, you will see that you're being charged for X number of CCF for that month. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if it is two CCF or below, you're not paying any extra for that. That's, that's in what we call it, you know, your sort of base fee to make sure the pipes work and all that, that stuff, the pipes out in the roads. Then what happens is then when you when you go above that and you're and you're using three to six CCF, which is somewhere around where most people on average, I think, are between that and the next level. Um, if you're using that amount, then for each of those CCFs, you're going to be charged 364. Then when you go up to the seven to 10 CCFs, then that rate goes up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So look on your bills. And one really cool thing about the bills is, and that you can go into your account electronically also, and you can look and you can see not just what happened this month, but last month and the month before. And what I like to do is to look on my bill and compare it to uh, the same month last year. And that's a really good indication of sort of where you are with that and you can look back over your last year usage and you can say, huh, let's see, is that the month when I had all my relatives over and mm -hmm. you know, right. Uncle John okay. stayed for three weeks longer mm -hmm. than I thought and took long showers or you know, what's happening. But I recommend that people always 
look not just at your bill, but look at the amount you're using and compare it to last month and compare it to uh, that month last year because it's the easiest way to catch a leak in your house. Mm -hmm. And a leak can shoot your bill up really, really fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, take a look at that, start thinking about how you've been using that water. Has something happened differently? And um, yeah, stay on top of it because we do provide those tools for you. Does that answer your question? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah. All right, so let's take a look then a little bit about this program, this Smart Yards program. Um, which again, I'll make sure y'all get the, uh, the link to it later. But basically the idea is that there are nine general principles um, uh, that are good gardening principles. And out of this, you get, uh, you add up points basically, but it's smart yards. And so they call them inches and you need 36 inches to have a smart yard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it all is things that help not only uh, with good gardening, but it helps prevent runoff, rain runoff pollution from traveling into our waterways. So that's really what this program is about is water, water, and water. So let's take a look at some of the watering needs because this is a good thing to understand as you're thinking about what do I need to do with watering. So we often hear that you need one to two inches of water a week and for your plants. And it'll differ depending on your soil type and certain plants and, and how hot it is and so forth, how much the wind blows. But the reason for that number is because that one inch or so of water in the typical Middle Tennessee soils is going to get the soil moist down six inches. And that's great for your roots. You want your roots to grow as deeply as possible. So that's why you hear that figure. So what does that mean in terms of amounts of water though? Cause that's sort of, you know, ooh, one inch, what does that mean? Well, here's a way to look at it is on a one foot square ground. So if you, any of you do square foot gardening, uh, a one by one foot, uh, that one inch of water equates to a little over half a gallon of water that you need a week. If you have a 10 by 10 garden, then it's a little over 62 gallons a week. So there are ways you can start sort of think, oh, how much water do I actually need? But then you can control it. And some of the things you're going to see on here are things that um, are the smart yards principles and sort of how you get those inches towards them, which is my way of assuring you all that you probably all are really close to getting a certified smart yard, which is cool. It doesn't come with a bumper sticker that says my yard is smarter than your honor student, which I would love to have that bumper sticker made. One day I will. But uh, it is a great way to, you know, show to your neighbors if you get a yard sign to show, you know, hey, I care about our waterways and, and here's some things I'm doing. Anyway, so, so what are some things in this program that we teach that can help you make the most of the moisture that's in your soil? Because like recently it's rained a lot. Mm -hmm. So, okay, a couple things. One, make sure your soil isn't compact. So think about this. If you take a really heavy mower and mow over your lawn, or worse, you drive on your lawn <laughs> too often, um, or you even get up and walk around on top of your garden beds, then that compacts the soil. And once it compacts, it's hard for the roots to get through and it really squishes out the water in the air in the soil. And then it's very hard for the water to penetrate again, especially when you have our lovely clay soil. So if you have a bed that you've really compacted, then we can get all this rain, but that rain will just sheet right off. It'll almost be like going on concrete. It won't do you any good. Mm -hmm. So one thing you can do is basically for garden beds, Treat all of them as if they were a raised bed. Basically, don't go tromping around on them. Try to stay off of them. And that will help in the worms will come in and eat stuff and loosen things up, dig little to a, little uh, holes in there and tunnels and the roots can get down in there and you won't be compacting your soil. So that's a big deal. Now, one of the most important things though is this two to three inches of mulch and using a natural mulch. Because if you have that moisture in the soil, then it doesn't take very long if it's just bare soil for the sun to heat it up, pull that moisture out, it's just gonna evaporate away. And if there's wind, 
then it's going to help with the evaporation as well. But if you can get some mulch on there, and again, we recommend two to three inches, then that is going to really stop a lot of that evaporation. So that's going to really keep the moisture where it belongs, which is in the soil for your plants to use. And I've gone through and I've, I've checked myself. There were some areas that I had just gotten in a hurry earlier this spring and I hadn't gotten a mulch. And then there are some areas I had mulched, um, you know, as I went back and was looking at the beds. And then one day I went back in there and I thought, do I need to water? And easiest way to, to know if you need to water is to stick your finger down in there um, and, and root around a little bit. And the one that was mulched was nice and moist, a couple inches below the ground. The one that wasn't mulched, totally dry two inches down. So it makes a big difference. We want you to use natural mulch because, um, you know, it's going to decay and become part of the soil. And all that organic material that becomes part of the soil is going to end up holding water for you, as well as having nutrients. And then the really big thing you can do to keep that rainwater on your property is to make sure that you have something growing and you prevent that stuff from running off your yard. Um, so for example, if you have some bare patches, then, you know, get something growing on them or at least cover them with mulch. And that will prevent the water from again, just sheeting right off your property, heading down the road, either into a ditch or into a storm drain and, and down to a creek. We want you to keep that water on your land and get it absorbed if you can. So let's see what else we have. Okay, so let's talk about watering efficiently and what that means. We talked about the one inch a week. Now, um, probably you've all had the same experience I have where you, um, you know, you're at the grocery store and it's pouring down your rain. You're like, this is fantastic. My garden is getting wet. I only live, you know, two minutes away and you get home and it's dry and hot at your house. So we have all these pop-up storms, right? It's just not fair but it happens. And so when you're thinking about one inch a week, we all really have to look at that microclimate of, of what's happening at our house. So if you have a rain gauge, that's a great idea. Um, if you have one after it rains, go ahead and dump it out. Um, don't, uh, don't leave it to uh, just collect mosquitoes. Um, but it's, it's good to sort of keep an eye on the rain, either in your mind, knowing we got a big soaker, or, you know, a rain gauge, it's a lot of fun. Now, rain barrels. I personally love rain barrels because I sort of feel like a genius every time I use mine. And because I'm thinking, ooh, look at me, I've got free water, it just came out of the air and this is great, but they're useful in a lot of ways. So, um, so the rain barrel can collect the water for you, right? And then you can use it and feel like a genius. Um, but it also is a way, if you have a, a spot near your house that often ends up getting way too muddy, or you want the water to, of course, stay away from your foundation and you're having problems with that, then what you can do is you use the rain barrel to control where that water's going when it rains. And the way you do that is you put a hose on the bottom of the rain barrel on the spigot, and it, it might be a soaker hose or it might be a regular hose. And then get this, when it's going to rain really hard, especially for days on end, you turn it on. So you're not just, you're collecting water, but you're not just saving it because you're gonna end up with way too much water. It's gonna overflow anyway. But what you can do is you can direct all that rainwater away from your house. You can direct it to somewhere you need it or just make sure that you've got it in an area away from your house or maybe somewhere with a lot of plants. Like I have an area that I think has grown really, really well because at first it had some small trees and a few small bushes. And I noticed recently they've got gigantic. And I think that's because that's where I always direct when I have too much rain, that's where I direct the overflow. And that's where I direct the hose if I'm doing that is that area. So those roots must be fantastic around that area because we've watered very deeply there. So you can use a rain barrel that way. One, way to, uh, one thing to understand about a rain barrel is you have a lot of water coming off of your roof. Um, you have, um, you know, showing you earlier how much water it, it takes to water one square foot, for example. So off of your roof, you can get um, 623 gallons will come off of a 1,000 square foot roof with one inch of rain. 
So it's a lot of water will come off of there. So, um, so all rain barrels need to then have some sort of overflow hose that's gonna direct that water out. But rain barrels are great, we love them. And next year, every other year, so it'll be next year, 2022, we will once again at Metro Water Services be doing a pre-order for rain barrels where um, in Davidson County, you can get a um, discount on those rain barrels. So be looking for that to come up. Okay, the adjusting speakers, at sprinklers and the mowers, this is a huge thing. It's a tiny thing and it's huge. If you have automatic sprinklers, especially, or if you put sprinklers out, make sure that they're adjusted so that they're, this sounds really commonplace, it, it sounds like common sense here, but make sure that they're adjusted to just hit the areas where you have stuff growing. You know, the sidewalk and the street are not going to grow no matter how wet you get them, but it drives me crazy. People will have their sprinklers set and, you know, I don't mind if I get to walk through it on a hot day, but, you know, they're wasting a lot of water if it's going out and running down the street, right? Mm -hmm. So make sure your sprinklers adjusted. If you have automatic sprinklers that are set to go off at certain times and days, um, make sure and have some control over those because we've probably all gone by a large yard that had sprinklers going when it was pouring down rain. And that's just a waste. And then you're creating all this extra runoff and everything. Now, mowing your lawn a little bit higher sounds a little wrong sometimes because you might think, ooh, it's going to just grow maybe even faster of, well, I have to mow more often, but not really. What you're doing, if you mow and change your mower to three inches, a lot of people are, you know, sort of scalping their lawn, but if you give it three inches, then that grass is going to create really great root structure. And the more roots it has, the less extra watering you have to do. So that's really important. So think about moving your mower up if you're sort of scalping your lawn. And you'll notice in the summer, if you get out there and uh, you, could, you could tell who has cut their lawn too low in the summer because it will brown out really fast after they cut it because there's, you know, it's just not going to rain enough. In the meantime, when you do water um, any of your plants, make sure that, again, you're getting nice deep water on them once a week is more important than getting a little bit of water every single day. A little bit of water will send those roots straight back up to the top and they're just gonna, you know, they're gonna get roasted by the sun later on. Okay, so, so think about how you water, try to do it efficiently. Ah, here we are. Here is the, I thought I had this somewhere. Here we go. Um, so yeah, this is an amazing fact that you can get 623 gallons if it rains an inch on 1000 square feet of your roof. Isn't that amazing? which is why if you can get a, um, a large container for a rain barrel, that's good. Um, you may want to put multiple rain barrels on different downspouts in your house, if you're thinking about that. But there is a lot of water out there to be harvested. So also, if, you, um, if you're thinking you don't wanna do that on your main house or something, but if you have a garage or if you have any kind of outbuilding like a storage shed, then they can be set up so that you can harvest water off out of them, which is cool. Okay, so now this is a biggie in our program and it is a biggie for our, our environment, our neighborhood streams. And that is again, when the rain hits your yard, your house and your yard, and if it leaves your property, if it runs off your property, then it's gonna carry with it anything that was on your property. So as it runs across your driveway, if you had a leak in your car and you had oil that dropped on there, it's gonna take that oil with it. If you spilled some fertilizer or spilled some herbicide or any other cleaner um, on your driveway, for example, and it rains, it's gonna wash that right off. And where's it gonna go? It's gonna go in our stormwater system. Well, what does that mean? Um, that means it's headed for a creek or stream or river. So if it goes down a drain in the street, those drains go straight to the nearest creek. If it goes down a, if it goes down a ditch and there's enough of it so that it doesn't absorb into the ground, if it just keeps going, like in my neighborhood, um, I'm not too far from the river and so my ditch down the road ends up uh, leading into a little stream that goes straight to the river. So 
we want people to really think about where is this stuff going and how can we keep that water on our property so we're not polluting the rivers, but also so that we have that moisture in the ground for our plants, right? I'm really in favor of people, keep it. It's free, you got it, keep it. So one of the things you could do is look at your downspouts that come off the side of your house. Where are they directed to? If they are directed so that they come right out and go to, um, you know, say some concrete somewhere, if they're going right out onto your sidewalk or right on to uh, your driveway, then, you know, that's not gonna get absorbed. Now, if you're lucky, that will then run off into a grassy area and then it will get absorbed, but it might not. It might just keep going to the street. So, you know, you can get those sort of accordion-like um, tubes, those downspout uh, extenders that you can put on your downspouts and you can actually redirect that water and you can direct it into where you have plantings. So maybe you have some bushes or maybe you have a garden bed up against the house, um, then that rain would be better used probably in that garden bed. So we do suggest people look for that. Worst case scenario, you're in a older house and you notice that your downspouts just disappear into the ground. That is the worst case scenario because what's happening there is they're going into, usually it's sort of a clay pipe you'll see and they just disappear. The worst of the worst case scenarios of those is that water then is going, um, it, it's a very old system, is actually going into the sanitary sewer system. And that extra water, remember, 623 gallons all at once on a thousand square feet, that extra water when it rains going into the sanitary sewer system, if there are enough houses connected that way, we can have a sewer overflow. So but we don't know where all of these are. So if you know people that have these, we're happy, I'm more than happy to talk to people about ways they can make sure they know where they're going, if they're causing that kind of problem and, and how they can, how, you know, some of the things they could do to fix that. Second thing that could happen could be, um, instead of going to the sewer, it could be going directly into a creek nearby. And that's really bad because you get enough of those going directly into the creek and you create flooding right? That's a lot of water all at once going into the creek instead of that water coming down, landing on your yard and having a chance to get absorbed. So any of those situations, we'd rather have the downspouts go somewhere where the water could be absorbed into some planted area. Now, rain gardens are really cool. Rain gardens are um, something that can be set up to help filter water that is coming onto your property or that is about to leave your property. Um, and also a way to sort of contain it. So, so here's a good example is, say you, you live along the street, you don't have gutters on the street, you just have, you have ditches and say the water's, uh, say there's a, um, a hill and the water's coming off of that side of the road into your yard. Well, all the junk on the street, you know, bits of rubber from tires, any car oil, any of that stuff, all that dirt and grime is coming off into your yard. And so a rain garden is basically a depression that's dug down and you, it takes a little of uh, thought because it has to be done in the right place to collect the water in the right size. And then it's planted first with some special soil, which really is a, a sandy type of mixture um, that will let it drain quickly into the ground, which acts as a filter for all those pollutants. And then the plants that go in it are native plants that are happy having very wet feet and roots when it rains a lot, and then are equally happy when it's dry throughout the rest of the year. So rain gardens are really neat because they're a way to filter and sort of contain some of the water either coming onto your property or going off of your property. So some people will put them near a downspout. Uh, some of our schools have them, for example, and it's where there's a lot of water coming off of a downspout and it's a way to sort of contain some of that. And the experts at that are our good friends, the nonprofit Cumberland River Compact, who have uh, put in, I see you, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, not in your head, Valerie. Yeah, they've mm -hmm. done a wonderful job getting rain gardens out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so here is a couple of examples of, of what I mean. The house in the upper left, you can see the water's just going to rush off there 
uh, their lawn. You can see it's causing some erosion there by the curb. You can see, um, you know, they have that, that big driveway. But then right below it in that picture, you see that beautiful garden that's, uh, you know, sort of dug in. It's got a little hole. It's got all those pretty plants in it. And that's a rain garden. And so that rain garden is solving their erosion problems. And that's a pretty steep hill, it looks like. And it's you know, it's, it's keeping that water right there and they have a pretty garden. Over on the right hand side is again, you know, just sort of an example of what I was saying is, um, you know, okay, yeah, it's, it's good to have your downspout like that top picture where it is gonna go into the grass, but you can see there's a lot of ponding behind it and so forth behind the, the little shoe thing you put there. Um, so there's a lot of water that's, that's having a little trouble soaking in, but then in the picture below, you see that they have run their downspout directly into a, an area where they're planting. So they can make use of that and there's a way to, to control that water. If you have a whole lot of water um, you know, coming down in an area, you have an area that's a little low and um, you're not sure about this type of planting, it is good to really take a serious look at it because you don't want the water coming up against your foundation, right? And causing that kind of problem. In some cases, they'll put in drains at the bottom, like a French drain, a, um, a tube that runs along the bottom that has little holes in it that will run the water out if you get too much water. So sometimes you do need um, to, to do a little more consultation on that. Okay, so, so what are some of the things that we've talked about here? And, and I mentioned that, you know, you could become a smart yard, a certified smart yard, and you're probably already on your way. But just looking at the things that we've talked about here, these very basic things that most people are probably already doing, you are a long way towards becoming a certified yard which we're excited about. We think most people are probably almost there that do anything with their yard. In fact, here, you know, you have those 21 inches or points towards 36. Um, ooh, and that's not 56 points for the reduced stormwater runoff and its pollutants. No, it's not. That would be five. I think I had COVID brain on this slide too. Um, okay, so, so just to uh, run by, what are some of the other fun things in this program? And by the way, um, on the website that I'll get to you, there are these nine different um, like 30 to 45 minute videos done by UT Extension experts on each of these areas. And there's also a tool to help you keep track of what you're doing in your yard and, and then how to apply for certification. So, um, so briefly, um, some of the things we hadn't touched on, some of the principles were the right plant in the right place. And, you know, but if you have a rain garden, you already are also working on this one. Or if you're doing any kind of native plants. And so you put in some native plants and that gives you two more inches towards your certification. Uh, we talk about reduce, reuse, recycle in the yard. And that's, ah, this is one of my favorite ones because again, it's something you're probably already doing and it really requires you to do almost nothing, which is if you mow with a mulching mower that just drops the gra grass clippings and you just leave them so that they'll decay and become mulch, um, then you get credit for that right? Because that's actually a good thing. We want those grass clippings adding to the lawn. If you do any composting, that's some more points. And then we have the use fertilizer appropriately, which is huge. And our big thing there is just read the directions, people, and follow them. Because so many people will buy, oh, it's not a very big bag. And I'm going to put this entire bag on my little condo front yard. And, you know, it was enough to probably do, um, you know, the stadium. So we really want people to watch the directions and, you know, take soil tests, things like that. See, you know, do I really need this before I put down something that might just run off my lawn? Also, a lot of people don't realize that you shouldn't be putting lawn chemicals down before it rains because it will just run off. And, uh, you know, so you sent pollutants to the rivers, but you also then have, you know, wasted your money. So then managing yard pests, again, if you're, um, you know, if you're planting any natives, then you're automatically doing something that attracts good bugs in most cases. And we want you to think about managing yard pests. Think about ways that you can do it that don't require that you apply anything. And here's why we say that, sort of hand in hand with the natives, is think about what eats, what eats your plants. 
Well, you have a lot of caterpillars that eat your plants. Well, know what eats caterpillars? Birds. Now, if you don't have any caterpillars, you're not gonna have any birds. And this is a great thing I learned recently. Um, uh, there's a man named Doug Tallamy that's been writing a lot of really cool stuff. Um, he's a um, uh, uh, entomologist, he's a bug guy. And so one thing, uh, they did a study, they had webcams um, set up in bird boxes and somebody counted and it takes between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to raise a clutch of chickadee babies. Can you imagine those parents are worn out <laughs> because they're not in a nest all that long, but they are back and forth, back and forth. What are they doing? Go back and forth. They're eating the caterpillars out of your yard. Mm -hmm. So finding any environmentally friendly way to either put up with some of that um, natural damage so that you have the natural animals in your yard is great. Hand picking things, moving them somewhere else. I picked up some uh, cabbage caterpillars today and I put them in the bird feeder. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I just, you know, be the middle band there. Um, so yeah, so so understanding that nature's gonna do its stuff and, and balance things out is good. Um, so if you're doing a rain garden, that means you're, you know, you're doing something with your water, right? Uh, that means there's gonna be some water there for a period of time and you're providing for wildlife with that. So rain gardens will hold water anywhere from 24 to 48 hours, we don't really like them. Uh, we, we don't want them to hold water longer than about 48 hours because then um, certainly after 72 hours, you run the risk of mosquitoes multiplying. So it's important they drain quickly. But during that time period, you have water that all kinds of little critters are going to enjoy. So you'll have some butterflies and some dragonflies and your little frogs and lizards and other cool things that you don't even see that will be enjoying that water. And again, um, native plants are things that the bugs need to eat. And when the bugs eat on the native plants, then we have, well, the frogs and the lizards and the birds eating off of them. So you're providing a buffet. So if you look at just these few things that we've added now to the things that we talked about with watering, then I actually did my math right this time, then you actually have a certified smart yard at this point. You have gained the amount of inches, the 36, to have a full smart yard. So we really, with this program, we just want people to be aware that all the things you're already doing, they're really good for our whole environment and therefore our whole neighborhood. Nashville is such a green place and we have so many waterways, like I mentioned, all of this makes a huge difference, just changing a few things. So again, you know, I've mentioned before, you know, this is all about runoff. So I want to show you this map as to why we're, you know, a big reason why we're doing this is um, if you look on this map of Davidson County, you'll see a lot of red streams. And that's what they are, is creeks and streams. And they're red on this map because they have some sort of pollution problem. And it's something that we at Metro Water Services are monitoring and we're trying to get them off of this list. And we want those streams to be healthy and not be you know, red on our maps when we draw them. And what we find is that in most of these areas, the culprits are not any kind of you know, big factory or something. We just don't have a huge amount of industry. Most of these areas, the problem is runoff coming from you guessed it, our yards from the residential areas. Um, big problem with dog poop, people not picking it up and all that extra stuff getting in the streams, all that bacteria and big problem with too much fertilizer getting in the streams. And what that does briefly is you get all that fertilize, fertilizer, which is extra nutrients into the streams, it makes algae grow really fast because it's a plant food, right? So the algae and other things grow. Well, then they decay. And as they decay, the process of them decaying involves all these bacteria that need oxygen and they get their oxygen out of the water, oxygen that's dissolved in the water. And so all of a sudden they take up all the oxygen in the water and then there's no water for the fish and the other critters that need it. So that's why we really harp a lot on fertilizer and the nutrients coming from dog poop. 
So yeah, so our goal really is to do as much as we can about these streams. We, um, we have inspectors that go out and deal with construction sites and deal with um, industrial sites and all of those kind of things, commercial sites, but unfortunately we just can't go knock it on everybody's door and, uh, and check it on everybody and, and all of our habits. So that's one reason why we have this program and are promoting all these great gardening things to groups is, is so people will really start thinking about it because we have to attack this the way it started, which is yard by yard. Um, so yeah, so that's our Tennessee Smart Yards program. And again, it really is, like I said, one yard at a time that we're working on here. And getting back to you know our original topic here about watering, let's continue to think about that because if you keep if you keep water on your yard, in your yard, you're building a sponge, right? And if you have a sponge, you have excess water in it that your plants will use. Um, anywhere you grow thing, things is going to start to become spongier than places where you don't grow things. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important to do that. Um, but some of the other things you can think about that I start thinking about, and uh, let's see, I'll stop sharing this. Yeah, you want to save some time. Yeah, to ask you yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, so I want to give you one little tip, which is my hot weather tip. When I start to freak out about everything being hot and there not being enough water um, for my plants, is uh, my favorite tip is if you are rinsing off something like lettuce and things like that in your sink, keep a bowl in the sink and take that wash water that you used from just rinsing off vegetables and use it on your plants. And if, if you get really wild about it, like I do, then when your water is heating up in your shower, I can't stand a cold shower, um, put a bucket in there, catch that water, put it on your plants. So those are my tips and I'm happy now to listen to your questions. Sure, yeah. Um, one, how do we get the smart yard like thing to track our points and all that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I have uh, put this link in the, uh, in the chat for you all. Okay. And yes, it's a fantastic website. You'll go on this website and there will be a place to start your journey towards certification. And then on the next page, it will have these, uh, they call them yardsticks. So it will have, um, there's a downloadable Excel sheet, if you like that, that will count up your points for you. And there's also something you can print out. There's an online workbook. So all of that information and these really great videos and other resources are on that website. It's really cool. Oh, and I want to tell you about two things you get in Davidson County if you become a certified smart yard. We give you gifts, or as I like to say, carrots. We have carrots <laughs> to bring you in. So one thing is we're partnering with Root Nashville, which if you haven't heard of that, Root Nashville is the city's partnership with nonprofits, so public-private partnership, with the goal of planting 500,000 trees in Davidson County uh, between now and 2050. And we are on our way. And so to help with that, if you become a certified smart yard in Davidson County, then they will give you a free tree. Oh, you get nice. to choose the kind of tree and you'll get it the next planting cycle, which right now will be in the fall. Mm -hmm. So that's very cool. And it's not like a little dinky stick. It's, it's a one inch across tree. <laughs> it is cool. The mm -hmm. other thing that will give you is Metro Water Services makes a fertilizer that is from the microbes that used to eat up wastewater and then we take them and process them and they get heated to over 1400 degrees um, so they get totally pasteurized and it makes this soil conditioner fertilizer and we'll bring you a bag of that and we like that fertilizer a lot because what it does it's it's a 550 so it's not um, oh, thank you for showing up. Uh, sorry, I went a little long. Um, but it's a great fertilizer because also it doesn't run off like some chemical based fertilizers do, some of the synthetics. So we will give you things. Good. Um, I have a question in the chat. Let's see. Let me go back to it. Uh, so does Metro allow curb cuts so water runoff on streets will also go into the garden um, as in the bottom photo? Oh, got it. Yes. Okay. So, you know, you will see some places 
where that kind of thing exists in the public right of way. So example on um, Dedrick Street, which you know runs from um, the courthouse to the Capitol, that's called a green street. And if you go look there, especially when it's raining, what you'll see is that there are cup curb cuts that go into where it sort of bulbs out and they've done some planting, there will be a cut into that so that the water as it comes down the hill will go into the planting area. So this is something that is part of what we call green infrastructure, which is to build some of those in so that stormwater ends up on that kind of property. Um, they're called, in some cases, they're also called stormwater control measures. And you may have, you may see a property, y'all need to start looking like it uh, parking lots now and walk around and see if there's an area where the curb is sort of cut and the water is going down into what looks like a, a depression with plants in it. That's why it's doing that. Mm -hmm. Another question in the chat, a rain garden filters the crud. After it collects the bad stuff, should that filter be changed periodically? How should this be done? Oh, great question. So yeah, so it's a natural filter, right? So the soil in there and the roots from the plants are going to naturally filter those pollutants as the water goes down into the groundwater. And that's what we want to happen. Now, what happens to all the crud? I love that term. That sounds like a very technical term. I've got to steal it and use it for now on. So the crud, a couple things happen to it. One of the coolest things that happened to it is that there are soil organisms that will eat oil particles and will process a lot of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So big deal with it is that it allows the water to slow down and, and get, we call it treatment. It's getting treated by the soil itself. That, that, so, that water otherwise, in many cases, like that house that we showed with that amazing rain garden, that water otherwise would come flying off their lawn, would pick up whatever was on the lawn, then pick up whatever's on the street, and then hit the storm drain in the street and take all that junk straight to a creek. And it stopped nowhere to be filtered out. So that's what's happening. Um, Rain gardens, you do have to be careful with them. If you get in there and compact them a lot, or if you pull out the plants or let too many plants die, then they're not going to filter as well. Um, if it gets filled up, um, you know, someone thinks, eh, I think I'm going to fill it up and then finds out, no, you actually were required to have that because there were some stormwater requirements, then it does have to be dug out and, and fixed. But normally, nature takes care of itself in a rain garden, which is very cool. I love that question. So let's see. Are there here. anyone yes. else that have questions? Anybody else want to ask Julie some questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, you talked about the rain runoff and picking up everything on the streets, and that you have inspectors that go out to certain sites. Um, I am battling and have been battling for the last several years with Red River disposal, dumping oil. And if you drive around the streets, you will see that they are dumping oil constantly. Who addresses that? Ah, okay. So um, are you reporting that regularly to the hub, to Hub Nashville? I am. I have okay. talked to okay. everyone. Okay. Um, so yeah, these can be those hard things to get at because they become sort of intermittent. But let's see. Um, you can, who do I want you to send that to? Send it to them, absolutely. But I tell you what, since I can't recall right away. I've already, I've emailed Sharon Smith every time. Right, right. And my um, council member. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But nothing gets done. Okay, go ahead. And if you would, I've, I've put my email in here in the chat, feel free to um, to email me that and I will make sure and forward that on. I know that we have a stormwater complaint line um, that that goes to for the inspectors and um, so that then we'll go out to them because we do get those, we get complaints for leaks and we get complaints for, you know, things like um, dumpsters that are leaking and into storm drains and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, some of those problems just take a long time. And honestly, you know, a lot of people beating their heads against things to, to get some of those problems fixed. But mm -hmm. 
Okay. But, but yeah, report those things when you see them. Okay, will do. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Oh, and I love this comment. Whoever just made this comment about, I'm just now seeing the end of it. So let me see the whole thing. Um, let's see. Someone was saying, oh, now's the season for lawn treatment companies. Yes. To fertilize and cultivate manicured lawns. How can we reach out to those companies or people who keep using fertilizers? Because preaching to people who care only helps so much. You're so true. We do need education to happen. People who think their manicured lawns are the only way. This is so true. Um, so this is always hard. Behavior change is hard with people. And I think a lot of it ends up being by, we, by changing the culture. And changing the culture means that there need to be more lawns looking like things that aren't perfect, you know? There right. needs to be more of that. And that's one reason why you do have, you know, the Smart Yards program, the um, Backyard Wildlife Habitat certification programs, um, more people putting their, um, sometimes because it's the only place they have sun, but more people putting their vegetable gardens in the front yard. Mm -hmm. And we see now such a diversity of yards. I think a lot of that is a matter of, of people seeing them and recognizing them and people gradually realizing, oh, that sort of is the aesthetic that I want. Um, in the meantime, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really hard one for us to get at. You're absolutely right. Um, I will say that, yeah, a lot of times when I go out and talk to gardeners, um, I think, oh, you know, am I, you know, just hoping they will grab somebody who doesn't garden and shake them a little while. Um, but oftentimes it turns out that people are doing what they learned. And a lot of times what they learned was mm -hmm. you put down this fertilizer at this time, you spray for these bugs at this time, you put down this bug killer at this time, and it hasn't occurred to them that that might have bigger repercussions. So we have had some change. I know the master gardeners I speak to each year, um, they they're actually making big changes as they understand, you know, that their water's leaving their property and going places. But um, yeah. yeah, oh, and somebody says, that's why you paid your $30 for your smart yard sign. <laughs> Who was that? I love you. You're wonderful. Yeah, also well deserved. in Shelby Park, they say Shelby Park Metro sprays poison around, around the Shelby pond to control weeds. What are they spraying? it goes right to the pond, then to Cumberland River. To Cumberland River. That, yeah, I you know what, I live right near there. Um, that is a really good question. I don't know what they're spraying. Um, I have heard that before. If whoever asked me that question or whoever wants to know, if you all want to email me, I am going to try to find that out, but I tell you something that I will suggest as well that will be helpful, which will be to contact the uh, Friends of Shelby Park, as well as the, um, who else, as well as the nature centers mm -hmm. and parks directly, mm -hmm. and because a lot of it is letting them know that people care. One of the things you'll notice right now that I've noticed recently in Shelby Park that they've started doing is they're creating areas that are no mow areas mm -hmm. where they're letting stuff grow up. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means that there's more room for wildlife. There's more room for native plants. There's more room for butterflies and bugs and all that kind of stuff and birds. But it also means for them, they don't have to mow, which is great. Mm -hmm. We'd all rather, you know, that that gas and that time was being spent somewhere else. Um, so, you know, it might be a really good time to start a conversation with them about, you know, hey, we're neighbors, we've noticed that there's these areas you're letting mow up, but then we've noticed that there's um, spraying around the pond, so we want to understand more about that and, um, you know, is there a way to protect that area? I know in Two Rivers Park, there's an organization called um, Grow Enrichment that a nonprofit that is using part of the park there to do some outdoor 
classroom space and programs for young naturalists for kids. And one of the things that they've been successful in doing has been working with the parks. Um, there's a, a pond right there and they've been able to get them to have a NOMO zone around a larger area of that pond. Uh, they've been gradually getting that increased each year um, so that there isn't spraying going on. So yeah, so absolutely um, contact them. I am gonna put that on my list because someone had mentioned that to me the other day when I was out walking and I thought, that's a good question. And then I forgot. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. Any other questions before we close out this evening? Well, Julie, thank you so much. You have been so informative. Uh, I appreciate all the knowledge around conserving water for our lawns and gardens, and then also the bigger picture in terms of our, our community. Hey, audience, thank you again for being here, all your great questions and comments. Julie put her email in the chat, so you can directly uh, contact her if you have any other questions uh, about this. Um, so next week, we're gonna have Eddie Latimer talking about uh, the possibilities of home ownership. So that should be a really great conversation as well next week. Uh, remember that great neighborhoods don't happen by accident. Find your neighborhood passion and work hard to make your neighborhood a safe and vibrant place. Thank you for being with us and good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.